Right. <clears throat> We're back in session in People versus Robert Durst. Mr. Durst is present with his lawyers, the, uh, <clears throat> Mr. Lewin and the, his colleagues are, are uh, present. Dr. Block, as I resume the witness stand, you remain under oath. You have one more question or a line of questions, Mr. DeGarren, and then uh, you may. You know, never trust a lawyer when they say one question. One line, one line. Of Actually, it's two, but they're related. No problem. <clears throat> Dr. Block, we, <clears throat> we saw um, on the screen uh, how Dr. Cook had uh, stepped in and told one of the clinics or one of the clerkships that she was withdrawing. Um, I want to show you uh, several other pieces of paper from her records, uh, which I will mark. There's three pages marked as page as uh, Exhibit C, Your Honor. Yes. Uh, exhibit C, if we can put that on the screen, the first page. Generally speaking, did you know Kathy Durst to be uh, frequently ill, not frequently ill, of good health, of uh, poor health? What was your impression? I, I wouldn't, I didn't know particularly. Okay. This first uh, document is a student evaluation and it uh, covers uh, a period of November 3rd to November the 30th, 1980. Uh, the radiology clerkship. Can you read that? I'll blow up the, the the bottom part that has the comments of this doctor, Doctor Deshmukh. Do you did I pronounce it correctly? Uh, do you did you know Doctor Deshmukh? I did not. Do, do you know if I pronounced his name correctly? I do not. Okay. <laughs> Mrs. Durst was unable to attend a large part of the clerkship, mostly due to ill health. So I've suggested to her she should repeat the entire clerkship at a suitable time. I'm also disappointed at her lack of responsibility in not returning the books she borrowed from our library in spite of repeated reminders. Um, <clears throat> you told us that you were checking your grades and nobody else's. Um, did you know that she had withdrawn from the radiology clinic? I did not. Is it, did you ever withdraw from a clinic? I did not. Uh, did you know that she, she had withdrawn from the surgery clinic? I did not. Uh, did you know that she'd withdrawn from the neurology clinic? I did not. All right, let me show you a couple of other pages. Here's the second page of Exhibit C. This one is dated July 14th, 1981. You were back by then, weren't you? Yes. All right. Uh, this is from the same um, professor or doctor, uh, Deshmukh, and says, this is to remind you, this is to Kathleen, this is to remind you that your radiology clerkship that you started in November of 1980 was never completed, and therefore your evaluation remains as deferred. In spite of repeated memos and telephone calls, you have not contacted us, and you have failed to return the three books which you borrowed from our radiology library. This is unfair to other students, to say the least. Let me stop there. Did you take a radiology clerkship? Um. I'm um, trying to think. I took it as an elective, not as a clerkship. Okay, I'm not sure that I understand or the it's, jury it's understands. It's similar, but I, I did spend time in the radiology department. Okay, I was about to say, I'm not sure that the, I understand or the jury understands the difference between an elective and a clinic. 
Uh, clerkships are required, electives are elective. Okay. You, you did something in radiology. Yeah. All right. Um, please arrange to return these three books immediately to me personally. I am always available during working hours in the Department of Radiology, and I uh, believe you are familiar with the area. I read that correctly? Yes. Were you aware that she, again, I think I asked you that, that she dropped the uh, radiology clerkship? I was not aware. And the third page of <clears throat> Exhibit C. This is uh, a student evaluation uh, involving the neurology clinic. Kathleen unfortunately had an illness in her family and was unable to complete the clerkship. She plans to make up the missing period later in the year. Uh, were you aware of any illness in her family? I was not. Were you aware of any illness that she had? I was not. Is that a function of you being basically casual friends and sometimes you'd ride together to the school? Uh, yes. And therefore you think you were not close enough? Yes. Okay. And as far as uh, your thought, you, if I can express it the way I understand it, that you're not certain that, or you're not sure that she would describe her illnesses. Maybe she would, maybe she wouldn't. Is that basically what you say? That would be conjecture. I wouldn't, I don't know. It would be conjecture, wouldn't it? You have to verbalize it. I said I, I wouldn't know. Okay. If you're describing an illness to a doctor, do you describe your illness accurately? Your Honor, that's in fact not an illness. Dr. Cook is not a medical doctor. <clears throat> Dr. Cook is. Uh, and would, would you describe your illnesses uh, to a doctor if you're going to Call the doctor and say I'm ill. Okay, okay. Uh, so your objection. Moment. The objection is assumed to not fact, not in evidence. Okay, so sustained. Well, I'm I'm going to your statement that you're uncertain. I, I think is where we came down, on whether she would describe her illness to a doctor. Uh, so my question is... State your objection. Relevant. Relevant. Because there's it's no not doctor why. she's don't, describing to. Don't, don't, don't. Well, I'm, I'm don't. Trying. Understood. Sustained. Well, as a doctor, don't you like uh, your patients to describe accurately their symptoms? I like a patient, to, a pay, when I have a doctor-patient relationship, for them to describe their symptoms, yes. Okay, and as to the statement that Dean Cooperman was not a medical doctor, he's a, a Ph.D., he was dean of the medical school, wasn't he? That again is... Uh, well, I'm sorry, then question. again, state, say the word objection state the grounds for the objection. Uh, then again, in explaining it, state the... Objection that it assumes facts not in evidence and lacks foundation. Sustained. Where was um, Albert Einstein College located in uh, New York City? It was in the Bronx. What part of the Bronx? Uh, it was Mars Park Avenue and the East Chester Road. Okay, uh, you're, you're very you're responsive to the question, but that's also a description that probably uh, goes over my head and others uh, because we don't know where that was. South Bronx, North Bronx, East, West? Southeast. Southeast, okay. 
And in the early 80s and late 70s, that was a pretty rough part of town, wasn't it? No, it's a very uh, uh, middle class, safe area, actually. Did you ever walk from the medical school to the hospital yourself, alone? Of course. Hmm. Okay. That's all? That's all. Thank you. Redirect. Start with this people's 25A. We're going to put this up. This is going to be uh, bait stamp 131428. Put it up in a second here. Mr. DeGaren asked you several questions about uh, Kathy and her rotations, and specifically what she passed, what she did not pass, etc. He asked you about her radiology clerkship. Do you recall that? I recall that he asked me about it. Yeah. I want you to look at the document that's put up, and I want you to tell me, does that reflect that between December 28, 1981 to January 24, 1982, a month before Kathy Durst disappeared, that she successfully took a radiology clerkship? Yes. Can you please describe what the ratings were for her in that clerkship? Uh, very good and uh, excellence in quality of workups, interpersonal relationships, and house staff potential. Can you please read that one? Can you house staff potential. Did you hear? Can you please read the narrative evaluation, please? Ms. Durst is a very pleasant student who displayed keen interest in the subject, although she missed several sessions. She had a fair a grasp of the background basic sciences and has sufficient clinical knowledge to be able to arrive at the logical conclusion. She is fairly quick in picking up radiological abnormalities and is a keen observer. She participates actively in group discussions and is eager to do a good job. And that's signed by the same Dr. Deshmook who Mr. DeGaren showed you a prior rotation from more than a year prior, is that correct? That's correct. And uh, doctor, as far as you can tell, did they mention the library books as a part of her rotation evaluation? Do you see that noted? I do not. In your experience as a physician, both as a medical student, a resident, et cetera, did you find the three books that Kathy Durst did not return relevant to her medical school performance, her rotation performance? No. Now I want to go through some other things that um, Mr. DeGaren asked you about. Um, one moment here, get it up. So, Mr. Garen asked you some questions specifically about Kathy's family, about the Durst name, et cetera. Do you have any information, yourself personally, through your observations, <coughs> that in any way that Kathy did not earn her way into medical school? I, uh, I don't know that she had, I don't know how to answer that question simply. Do, do you have any, as far as you know, was Kathy a um, well-performing, medical student, that, as you knew her? I, I didn't know her grades, but she was smart, engaged, and you know, obviously intelligent you know, in our discussions and stuff. What was her reputation within your medical school community in terms of the people that you knew that dealt with and knew you? In other words, we all go to school and there are certain people who don't have the greatest uh, reputations for you know, their studies, et cetera. I'm asking, what was Kathy's reputation? I think her reputation was perfectly good. <coughs> um, I want to ask you for a moment. You were asked about the injuries that you saw to Kathy's neck. Do you remember that? Neck? Excuse me. The, the injury that you saw to the eye. Yeah. That injury as you sit here and you kind of figure out and focus as to when that was. Do you know if it would have likely been during the period of time that Mr. DeGuerin had shown you those rotations where Kathy was not performing well? I object to the form. I object to the form of the question. Uh, doctor, you were asked.
asked about uh, <coughs> the trucks. You can use the lectern or the, the chair. Oh, okay. I'll just chair or lectern, either way. All right. You were asked by Mr. DeGarren about Kathy Durr's drug use, and you said that uh, you were unaware of it. Is that correct? Yes. Do you think if Kathy Durst had been addicted to cocaine, is that something that you believe you would have noticed in your dealings with her? I think if she was using heavily, I would have noticed. And in your experience, do you think that a medical <coughs> student is going to be able to get through medical school rotations normally as a cocaine addict? I do not think they, they would be using heavily, they would be able to get through their rotations. Does cocaine use, in your experience, does it cause strangulation, marks, or bruises? No. Um, doctor, have you ever had the experience where you had an image of somebody and it turned out not to be accurate? Yes. You said that Kathy appeared to be wealthy, right? She drove a Mercedes and uh, she lived in a penthouse. Is that right? Yes. Were you aware that Kathy was borrowing money to pay for medical school? I was not aware of that. Let me show you. We're going to mark as people's 41. This is going to be a 10-page document. LADA bait stamp 72258 through 72267. I want to go to, I want to, let's, let's start with the first page. First page is dated 3581. And it's a note saying that Kathy bounced a $3,800 check. Was that, were you familiar or aware that she was having financial problems? I was not aware of that. Do you have any idea what was going on in her home life? I did not. Do you know whether or not her husband was financially supporting her? I did not know. Do you know what their situation was at home in terms of how she was being treated? I did not. Now, you were asked previously whether or not Kathy would have told you if she was suffering from domestic violence and you said you did not know if she would have. Is that correct? Yes. I want you to assume for a moment that Kathy was struggling financially. Is that something she <coughs> discussed with you? She, I, she didn't discuss it with me. Does the fact that Kathy was struggling financially did not discuss it with you does that cause you to potentially reconsider your opinion as to whether or not Kathy would have discussed a personal issue like domestic violence with you? Well, I don't think she would have discussed either. I want to talk about, for a moment, Mr. DeGarren has put up various rotations, and he has indicated that, as an example, in November of 1980, he talked about the radiology rotation. Do you recall that? Yes. And you saw the note from the doctor, the same doctor where uh, approximately a year later, Kathy ended up successfully completing. Do you recall that? I do. So would you agree, doctor, that it would appear that Kathy certainly had the capability to do well in radiology? Yes. And let me ask you something. I want you to assume for a moment that a, uh, a woman is being beaten at home by her husband. I want to ask you if you think that that could cause a medical student to not perform well in their rotations. Absolutely. I want to ask you specifically about the surgery rotation. Can you tell me, in comparison to other rotations in medical school, what's the surgery rotation like? It's a very difficult rotation. You go in very, very early. You're on call very, very often. That was before the Bell Commission. so. Uh, you worked like 100 hours a week. And in your experience and your training, is that a difficult rotation for even individuals who um, are getting support at home? Yes, yes. Can you imagine as a medical student what it would be like to be in a rotation like that when you were being beaten and abused at home? It would be very difficult. Would it surprise you that a medical student experiencing that kind of home life would fail a rotation? It would not surprise me. Would it surprise you that a dean becoming aware of such a failure, let me uh, withdraw that question. 
when you fail a rotation, eventually, deans are going to get involved in terms of your, uh, your progress in medical school. Is that a fair statement? Yes. And I want to ask you, does it surprise you then? I want you to assume that Kathy, during 1980 and 1981, was being abused by her husband at home. Does it surprise you that eventually the medical school establishment caught wind that she was not performing well? Yes. Does that surprise you or not? It does not surprise me. I want to ask you, um, Mr. DeGaren asked whether or not you ever dropped the rotation. Do you recall that question? Yes. And the answer was no, is that right? Yes. While you were in medical school, were you ever beaten and abused in a relationship while going through a clerkship? No. Do you think that had that happened, is that something that might have influenced even somebody like you with your ability to successfully complete the rotation? Yes. I want to go through, um, let's go to page one. I want to continue with the people's 40, 41. Let's go to the next page. You weren't aware that Kathy had bounced the $3,800 the $3, check. I was not aware. And was that consistent, by the way, bouncing a check with the Kathy Durst that you know the image that she had? I wouldn't imagine she would bounce a check. I thought she was well to do. Based on your relationship with her, do you think that bouncing checks and struggling financially would have been embarrassing and painful to her? It would have been very embarrassing. I would be surprised if somebody would talk about it. Were you aware that on July 9th of 1981 that she had to get an emergency loan for $600? I was not aware. Were you aware <clears throat> you referring to an exhibit? Yes, I'm, I'm going to give the page. I have to get there. Page 5, this is Bates 072262. I'm sorry, when you give that Bates stamp, is that for the, who is that for? That, that's for the defense. You know, is that helpful to you? It, it, everything is Bates stamped by LADA members. Okay, so thank, thank you for doing that. I'm just making sure. So uh, you've, you, this, this, People's 41 has... Yeah. Ten, ten, pages. Pages. Ten, ten, ten pages. Ten pages, and you've shown, you've referred to three now. Yes, you? correct. Are, you, are these, shall I call these A, B, and C? No. No, it's just, okay, go ahead. I'm just going to call with court's mission 41, ten-page document. I'll refer to the pages. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Page five um, <laughs> indicates that Kathy Durst, on 11.579, borrowed $2,500 at an 8.5% interest rate. Were you aware that Kathy was taking loans even at the beginning of medical school? I was unaware. I want to go to page 7. Were you aware that... Do you see that document? Yes. Do you see that here is another loan that Kathy is taking that has dates of uh, 1977 to January of 1980 for $5,000? Were you aware that Kathy was taking out these loans? I was not aware. And in terms of the image that Kathy had, was it consistent or inconsistent with that image, that impression? that she was actually struggling struggling financially. It was inconsistent. Were you aware, doctor, that her husband uh, had her on an allowance, claimed he gave her an allowance? I, I did not know her financial. Ma'am, you were asked by Mr. DeGarren if you reported Kathy's domestic violence. Do you recall that question? I do remember that. And you said that you didn't, is that correct? That's correct. Do you wish you had? Um, I do, but there, there's a lot of 
problems with reporting. You have to have you have to have permission of the patient to report it. And, and let me ask you something. Um, in terms of not reporting it, can you tell me why you decided at that time not to report it? Um, I don't think it was the culture then to report it. That you encourage the person to report. It may have been that I, I didn't know I should report it. <coughs> and, and doctor, in terms of when you say it wasn't the culture, and I'm gonna go back to an area that we talked about previously during direct, Based on your interaction with Kathy, did it appear to you when this incident happened with the sunglasses that she wanted you and your coworkers to report this domestic violence? Uh, no. If I can ask you, I want you to describe what was her demeanor, if you had to describe how did Kathy look, and I don't mean the physical look of the injury, but what was her what was her response when she saw that her classmates saw that she was being beaten? There were tears in her eyes. And if I were to ask you, can you describe, that says what you saw. Can you describe, let me ask you, did she appear to be humiliated? She seemed to be sad and humiliated. Today, doctor, in the same situation, is that something you'd be likely to report? I would have pushed her to report much stronger. And as far as you know, at that cafeteria, at that table with those other medical students, and I'm not trying to cast any blame, but did anybody push and tell her you need to report it? I don't remember what I was telling her to report it. I have no further questions. Mr. DeGaron, three thoughts. This is a, it's kind of like a ping pong game, except this is going to be the last time. And I have just a couple of questions. Mr. Lewin asked you and you agreed that um, when someone was having the kind of troubles that we've seen that she was having, the deans are going to get involved. Right? Yes. And we've seen that Dean Cook reached out for her. It makes sense that if the deans got involved, as Mr. Lewin uh, asked you, it would make sense that if she couldn't make a rotation, a clerkship, she would call the dean that she'd had those dealings with, that got involved, would, doesn't it? It's possible, but I don't know. And on her financial situation, you know generally that people that use illegal drugs need money, they use money, and they bounce checks, don't you? Yes. Thank you, that's all. Anything else? <clears throat> May this witness be excused? Yes, Your Honor. Mr. DeGarren? Excuse? Yes, Your Honor. You are excused. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you very much. We have a, our first conditional examination to start to play, Your Honor. Yes, okay. I think Mr. Bailey and Ms. Uh, the other day when I had the officer on the stand, I had some exhibits, and I failed to move to admit them, Your Honor. I moved to admit those. I think we need to see them. Well, they're... they're no, we haven't moved any of them yet. We're already... The case isn't dead. Yeah, right. We do it at the end. We'll okay, do it at the thank end. you. Yeah. Sure. Thank you. Would you like us to do this out now? Please. Yes. Yes. Can we? Yes. Could we, uh, maybe it'd be better to take a five minute break while we move everything? Five minute break while you set up. So we uh, have a, a video recording of a conditional examination of a witness. It'll take about five minutes for the people to, uh, to move the equipment to set it up. So you may. Uh, if it's only five minutes, just stand and stretch. Maybe shorter. And this will be temporarily. We're going to get a more permanent, hopefully, solution. OK. okay. This TV had a slight mishap, so we're going to short one TV. Yeah. <clears throat>
he's doing that? Uh, yes. Uh, so we're back in session. Yeah. So the people uh, are prepared to present uh, a stipulated initial examination video. Yes, you can. Uh, you, if you uh, look at, so the jurors can see and uh, see you. You say that so they understand what it is. Yes. May I? I have a, a DVD containing the video. May I mark this as People's Forty Six. Forty Two. Oh, I'm sorry. Forty Two. Sorry, read it wrong. It's Forty Six minutes long. Uh, 42. All right, we'll see, we'll begin watching this uh, today and then pick up on, on Monday, yes. The transcript of it is People's 42A. Yes. I have a stipulation form. May this be uh, 42B. Yes. And the stipulation is as follows. I'm sorry, in the recorded testimony of Peter Wolf presented to the jury, there are exhibits referenced. Duplicates of these exhibits will be marked with new exhibit numbers for purposes of this jury trial. The following is a complete list of the reference exhibits by their original exhibit number, a description of the exhibits, and the new exhibit number assigned for this trial. In other words, they had different exhibit numbers when this took place. They're going to have new exhibit numbers now. And yes. I, I have the exhibit used in this video. There's one. May I mark this as People's 42C? Yes. And People's 42C here, which is five pages of handwritten notes dated March 3rd, 1981, under the heading Kathleen Durst. At this hearing, they're going to be called People's 64 in the video. But today, they are People's 42C. Very good. And we have additional transcripts for the court reporter. And we actually have one, because we have the ticket set up for Herbig. If any jurors need a transcript because they can't read the subtitling today, we've made additional copies if anyone would like to hold the transcript. So uh, I see some hands raised. Do you have copies for, how many copies do you have? We've got 20, over 20, so. <clears throat> All right, you may uh, publish it to who, who would like juror. to actually hold it. You can, why don't you give it to everyone? <laughs> give what else are we going to do with this? What are we going to do after? Yeah. Yeah. Or collect them or what? Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Are you, it's on a video. You wouldn't be transcribing it anyway, right? Oh, your name's on it. Oh, okay. Yeah, no, the players are out of program. Oh, we have one for Mr. Durst. Okay. About me? Yes. May I approach this? transcript in your seat and it'll be there for you on Monday to uh, for the balance of it and then and then we'll collect them all right are you ready uh, mr. Milius I believe so let's try okay and maybe not you <laughs> 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 Thank you. 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 Thank you.
uh, it was frozen. Okay. Individual medical students when they were rotating through the hospital 
supportive and uh, participating in the uh, surgical care of patients. Okay, so that's what I wanted to ask you about a little bit, um, just to explain very briefly. What is a clerkship as it relates to a medical school? A medical school is four years. Um, the, first, you know, the first year is sort of normal. You learn about anatomy, you learn about physiology. And the second year is sort of uh, abnormal. You learn about diseases, what can go wrong with the various anatomy and physiology, and what kind of disease is strike. I think there are 10,000 of them. And then the third and fourth year, the students uh, spend time taking care of people. And they, uh, they go on to the wards, into the hospital wards, and they assist in the care of patients. And they will have a pediatric rotation where they get to spend time with pediatricians and pediatric patients. They have a medical one where they go to the medical round and see patients with heart disease, lung disease. And then the surgical clerkship where they spend a month or two on the surgical services um, where they participate in operations. And they go around uh, with the residents and the attendings. Uh, they help care for the patients in the uh, Doing in gradually increasing ways, initially kind of changing dressings and authorizations, and they, they learn, the object is to learn what it is to be a doctor. Okay, and so then you were in charge of setting up and managing the surgery rotation for Albert Einstein Medical School. Yes, I was. So then a student who was having their surgery clerkship, were you just setting up with a colon and rectal experience or were they, were they just in the surgery department and they're having many different experiences of many different kinds of surgeries under many different doctors? That, that, that is, they went, they went into all kinds of operations, not just the ones that I did, but in, in all aspects of surgery, including chest, heart, uh, abdominal. Okay. And you oversaw the entire surgery program. Mm -hmm. What year students in particular did you teach? Did you say was it third year? Primarily third, but I also uh, consulted with fourth year students who needed guidance and um, and direction. And as of I want to talk about 1981. Um, for how long had you been running that surgical teaching program? Well, I, I I did it in the entire time that I was an attendant because. I did it at uh, at Penn State Medical School, which was from '76 to '79, uh, and then in '81 I've been doing it since for six years. I had uh, overseen a thousand thousand medical students at that point. Okay, and in your role, how much interaction did you have individually? with the students that would come to the surgery rotation? Well, I had quite a lot. I mean, more, more with some than with others. Um, clearly, some were not interested in surgery, and some were interested in surgery. Um, but uh, I saw medical students on, uh, uh, on teaching round. One of my uh, responsibilities as monitor was to oversee the, uh, the patients of uh, the chairman of the department, who was Dr. Marvin Cleveland, who was a, uh, a, a world famous hepatic uh, uh, and biliary uh, surgery and pancreatic surgeon. And he had a very busy practice. He actually went to Rome to take care of the Pope when he was shot. But I, I looked at, uh, I, I looked in on his patients when he couldn't make rounds. I did a teaching round for the, uh, the residents and the medical students. And we would go from patient to patient and discuss the problems with the patients and talk to the patients. And they did that with the, the residents and, and medical students and my own patients. Okay. So other than having one-on-one -on -one interactions with students who were actually assisting you with your patients from your rounds, did you have any other opportunities in your role to meet with you know, the, the third year medical student? Yes, I did on a regular basis. Uh, twice a week or sometimes more, I came to uh, small group teaching sessions. Uh, we had a conference room which was uh, opposite in the Department of Surgery, and I would meet with the medical students who were rotating 
for the hospital in a small group teaching session um, in that room. There were usually six or seven students, and I would lead a, um, a discussion with them about the various aspects of surgery, particularly um, emer the emergency room and how they were going to deal with a person standing in front of them saying, it hurts, okay. and uh, what they were going to do. And I presented to these students um, various scenarios, and I asked them, what do you do here and what do you do there? Uh, the purpose of this was for me to see how they were doing, to see what they were, whether they were functioning properly, whether they were thinking clearly, they were, whether they had the confidence to, uh, to proceed. And sometimes I, I, uh, I found that they, most of the time, they were terrific. And was this really terrific? Terrific. 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 Uh, they were very intelligent. They were really terrific, uh, terrific students. And um, I enjoyed working with them, but occasionally I had to refer uh, a uh, person for a little um, psychological support. Um, for, uh, let, me, let me stop there because sure. um, I want to ask you about other than these group sessions, would you have any occasion ever? Part of your routine practice to have any one-on-one -on -one time with any of the students. And other, um, other than during the rounds when you were seeing patients, all, all the time. How so? I basically, uh, I basically spoke with every medical student who rotated through the, uh, the department on a one-on-one basis. Why did you do that? I did that to uh, to counsel them. Uh, first of all, I needed to, you know, we're about to, to set these people out into the, into the, into the world to take care of you and me when we're, when we're injured. And uh, I, it, was, it was my responsibility for the medical school to make sure these people were ready. And I was there to give them guidance, to help them. Um, I particularly asked for this job because when I was a third year medical student at the uh, New York Medical College, I was sort of floundering. I didn't quite know what I wanted to do. And a person in the same role that I was now and really tight and healthy. So I, I was grateful for that advice and I look forward to doing it. So I'm here with everybody. Your assumption is correct, Mr. Milius. <laughs> <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, even those I can't see, I am going to, we're going to try for 9.15 on Monday. We, we're, we're working our way towards 9 o'clock is my goal, but we'll, things will go so smoothly that we'll be ready each day at 9. We're going to try 9.15 on Monday. So have a, uh, <clears throat> over the next three days, take care of yourselves, be well, be safe. Remember, don't talk about the case or any of the people or any subject involved in it with anyone, including the other jurors. Do not make up your mind about the verdict or any issue until after you've discussed the case with the other jurors during deliberations. No tweeting, no Facebook, no social media. See you Monday. Department 1 is adjourned.